Welcome to Challenging Paradigm X. What is the foundation of becoming a champion? How important is failure for growth and personal development? And is a championship mindset something that anyone can learn? My guest today is Dieter Kalt. As a former professional ice hockey player, he is a three-time Olympian, participated in 17 World Championships, and has been selected into Austria's ice hockey team of the century. After being one of Austria's most successful athletes, he became a sports coach and manager before carrying his knowledge about teams, leadership and success into the business world, where he works as a C-level coach and keynote speaker. He is the father of four and his latest project is a matter of heart for him. The Future Stars Mentoring Program, which exists to inspire the next generation of young people with a dream to ignite their talent and reach their full potential. Dieter won nine championships out of his 22 seasons in three different countries, and many of these as the captain of his team. So he's clearly a true champion, and he shares his knowledge of what it takes to become one in and outside of sports. So, if you're interested in finding out more about Champions Mindset, stay tuned. Hi, here's Xerxes, and today I'm here with Dieter Kalt. Dieter, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Hello, Xerxes. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be on your podcast. My name is Dieter Kalt, just like you said. And I have been an athlete all my life. I'm 47 years old now. I'm a father of uh, four kids. And I used to be a little boy with a big dream. And my dream was becoming a professional hockey player and becoming the best player in the world. So that's, that, that was the start. I come from a sports background in my family. My dad used to be a, a hockey player and then he used to be a manager. And then he was the president of the Austrian Hockey Federation for many years. So he was my partner um, through my whole career. I learned from him. He was, a, he was my role model. And I got to view both sides of the coin from early on. So I'm, I, had a, I had a normal youth. I was growing up chasing my dreams. Obviously, I was going to school. I was playing. I was doing several sports. I was playing soccer. I was skiing. Growing up in the south, in the southern part of Austria, the winters were cold and the lakes were frozen. So I was uh, playing hockey all the time. And I had this, I was not the, I was not the biggest guy. I was not the guy with the hardest shot, but I had this determination to win and to get better every day. And um, this, this kind of mindset. And obviously that was something that I learned from my dad and my peers and from the club that I played from my coaches and mentors and this kind of grew. So I finally got the chance to turn pro. When I was still in school, I was 16 years old, starting to play with the pro, with the older ones. And then again, I had those role models who were pushing and pushing and pushing. And my goal was, I, I had this huge goal of becoming the best, but that was kind of, I didn't know what I was, what I was doing that time. I didn't know what it meant really, but that was kind of the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the beacon. Um, so that gave me that kind of direction. And uh, I was, I kept working and working and working. And, and one day I, I had the chance to become pro. And then I wanted to take the next step. I wanted to get better. What can I do next? Where can I go next? So I started playing for the national team, for the Austrian national team. And that's when really my whole career kickstarted to be able to present yourself on an international stage, to represent your own country where the thing, the sign on the chest is much more important than what is standing uh, at the back of your jersey, I, I really felt at home in that kind of environment, trying to compete against the best in the world. That was unbelievable for me. And actually to get that feeling that, you know what, I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm not that far away. If I push a little bit harder, if I try a little more, give me a little bit more time and I can grow, like this confidence started growing. And I took step by step, I started playing in, in Germany. I, I played in, I played in the US, I played in, in Sweden for a couple of years and then a couple of stages in Austria. I became captain of the national team and competed in 17 world championships throughout my career and three Olympic games. And I'm like, okay, at the end of my career, I was like, I had to call somebody 
for st- when I had my first when I, well, when I had my first uh, gig on stage when I was talking about champions mindset, what it takes to be successful, what I learned in my career, I had to call a guy and ask him for my stats. I had no clue. Well, obviously I played for 22 years professional, so it was quite a long time, but I was never good with the statistics. So I, I, I asked that guy, hey, what were the teams? I, well, I knew the teams that I played on, but how did we end up? Uh, what were the years? I mixed everything up. So there was this sheet of statistic of numbers at the end that he came up with. He was laughing at me and I was looking at it and I'm like, well, not too bad after all. I, I didn't even realize it was just, I still felt like, fuck, some days I'm so bad. <laughs> I'm so bad. I can be so much better. But on paper, everything looked really good. So I started thinking, what it, did it really take to get there? Because not everything was planned. I mean, I planned, you, as, a, as an athlete, you plan the practice and you plan the weeks and the months and what kind of goals you want to reach. Everything is planned that way. But the big goal, it always seemed so far away. And I realized early on, uh, pretty early on, that it's not really about the goal at the end. It's what happens in between. And that's, you know, you hear that so many times. Der Weg ist das Ziel in German. It's about the path and not, not, the, not the goal. And by not being able to overcome many of my big obstacles that were standing in my way, because not everything went my way in, throughout my career. Um, for some years, everything went smooth and the, and the career went like this. But then I, I started to hit some rocks and, and, and some injuries and some things didn't go my way. Obviously, there was big competition and, and there was a lot of great players uh, looking for jobs and and. And I was trying to fight hard against every obstacle. You know, I'm strong enough. I can go through through the wall with my head first. But only when I started to realize that, you know, for some reason, I don't know how I came uh, upon that, that I cannot fight against it. I had to let it go, kind of accept it and let it go. I, you know, it, it feels like water running around with some obstacle. It takes different paths. But, you know, I ended up in better situations afterwards, every time, by by feeling something really negative, like being really down and thinking, oh, my, my career, I, I screwed up my career now. Bad move, bad decision. I'm not good enough, whatever. I ended up in better situations because I kept working. I, you know, I always had to fall back on, okay, what can I influence? What can I influence? Take away everything that, 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 that comes upon me, the pressure and the things I cannot influence, but what's my basis? And that was always the, the attitude, the mental attitude, the mindset and what kind of work I put on the table, what can I influence? And every time I, I took this step back and focused on that and let go, um, actually I ended up in better spa- in, in better spots. And once I realized that, and I was lucky to realize that mid twenties. So I had a long career still going on after that. I kind of made a system out of it because I lost my way many, many times, you know, but I figured something out how to get out of holes quicker again, because I knew that feeling, okay, it's okay. It's okay to screw up. It's okay not to be able to, to reach that one goal. Okay. Maybe that's a sign. Maybe I go a different direction and see where it takes me. So I've been studying this. And once I, and once I, I, I ended my career, I felt so grateful for that kind of life because it was life so far you know everything i did was because of passion and it was not easy it was not fun all the time but it was always passion it was never a job it was a lifestyle that's me i'm i'm an athlete i am competing i want to win i want to be on a team i want to help others i i know how i can take care of myself so what can i do next to help others to succeed um because i realized by helping others I get more successful myself. So that's, that was a time when I became that leader, that captain of teams, for example. It was not about me anymore. So it was kind of in a progression. So once I stopped, once I stopped playing, obviously I, I, I had to think about what, what's going what's gonna to happen next. It's not something that you plan as an athlete or many athletes don't, do not like to think about life after sports. And I had some discussions in my own podcast with professional athletes. And they said, you know, that's, I'm, I'm really aware of this, obviously. But I cannot let that thought 
creep into my head because it's going to take down, it's going to take away a little bit of my focus, what I have to do to be great tomorrow. So, but then the day comes and suddenly reality hits. And then you have to be really, you have to know yourself. Who am I? What identifies me? Is it just the, the athlete with the helmet on or with the, with the soccer shoes on or whatever sport it is? Or what's the, who's the person behind it? And I had to go through that process and uh, myself too. Thankfully, I was prepared for that. I never got that. Well, it feels good if people pat on your back. Oh, you're so great. You're the best. It feels good. There's the other side of the coin too, where you are just, you know, if you lose, nobody likes you. But it feels good. But if you put it in the right perspective and you don't get all your self-confidence needing from you know, appreciation from other people, but from your family, from your best friends and from yourself, when you look in the mirror, hey, I did good. It's good what you do, even though it's not perfect. It kind of prepared me for what's going to happen later. And I said, you know, I, I, I met so, so many people throughout my career, um, through all ages. And I was not, like I said before, I was not the most talented guy. I, see, I saw so many guys fail. I, got, I saw so many guys disappointed or frustrated, not knowing and, and feeling worthless. And I said, there was a way how I did it and I learned it from others. I tried to put different things together that started working for me over time. I really like to pass this on. And I saw it and that's my mission right now. I help, you know, on one side, I help young people who trying to, trying to reach the potential, but don't know how, where there is so much energy like it is right now, if you talk to like to young people, there's they're the ones who are going to save the world sooner or later, right? But which way to go? You can have the best ship and the best captain, but if you don't know where to go, you need those little hacks and those little guardian angels, those mentors sometimes. Sometimes you need a kick in the butt. Sometimes you need somebody to pull you or just to to be there for you. So I want to be that guy to the next generation. It it it. it filled me with joy with the people I worked so far. That's something that I want, that I wish for myself to be a good mentor for my kids. I have, like I said, I have four kids. I want to be a good role model for them. And there's so much need and, and there's so much I want to give. So that's something that I, that I want coming from that perspective. Okay. How can I, what can I influence? It's up to me to take my life in my own, into my own hands, to be prepared for that one moment. That's the thing in sports, right? That mon one moment, that one uh, free kick or that one penalty shot, that one moment that can make or break a career or a season. I always wanted to be that guy. I always wanted to be that guy. How did I prepare? I prepared by practice, 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 and failing, 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 using that, that, that famous word, failure. You know, it's, it's, athletes are laughing about this because, you know, that's the only way to get better is to do something too fast, too hard or not hard enough. And you have to try again and have to think about technique. Am I prepared? What can I do? How can I reach that? So that's a normal, that's a normal thing. But then I said, you know, if I'm prepared well enough, I prepare as good as I can to be able to improvise in that moment. And I want to take it with both hands. And if I fail, that's fine. That's fine. Then I find a way to do it better next time. But it's that feeling that I try to do it. I didn't hide in that. And that's something that, that you can practice. So I want to give that to young people. But I have been the manager after my, after my professional career. I was a coach. I did a three-year coaching, studying to be a professional coach. Uh, the, the, the A license in Austria. It takes three years to do that. I did that beside my when I was still playing professional hockey, and uh, so I can I can transfer my knowledge better. So I was working as a coach with some with different national teams in the junior national teams and in the in the in the pro national team in, in Austria. I was responsible for developing a youth program in a professional hockey team in Austria, my hometown, where I came from. And then I got the chance to work as a sports director, being responsible for the pro teams and the, the youth program. So I went through all the different positions of leadership, so to speak. So one, and obviously had a different role. I was not the guy on the ice anymore. I was the guy who was trying to build that environment for other people to succeed. Again, I needed everybody else to be good 
to be able to succeed myself. The only problem was sometimes, you know, if you're not here as a coach, for example, you're standing on the sidelines and you're watching people and you cannot influence that second somebody makes a decision on the field. The only thing you can do is to prepare those people as good as you can so they can make their own decisions in that kind of environment that's good for everybody. But you cannot be do it yourself. And so sometimes that's frustrating. So I was looking at leadership from a different perspective, from up there, so to speak, making being responsible at the end. And that's what I do with entrepreneurs, with business leaders who come to me and say, I need that look from, I need that look from the outside. I know what I'm doing in my profession, but I'm not a great leader yet. I need that. I need that kind of culture change because I understand if we want to be better, we have to come together as a group. Everybody has to be in the right role. There has to be chemistry. There has to be energy. There has to be responsibility and ownership. Help me bring this to our company. And that's where I come in. And I really like doing that because that's like working in a sports leadership team where there's different opinions on the table and you discuss and you fight sometimes. And one guy has to make a decision at the end. He goes out and they speak with one voice. That's what happens in winning organizations. And that's what I try to bring to business, for example. So that's, that was a long story, but that's exactly what I do. I'm trying to tell my story and, and, and trying to inspire people. I, I try to make people follow me on, on uh, different channels to see me fail and to me to see me suck at different things all the time. I'm trying to get better, you know, one, one day at a time. So like one thing I remember when I was a kid, I saw you uh, on television and sometimes there were games, obviously, that you didn't win and your team didn't win. And when uh, when you were interviewed and were asked about who, who was to blame and if, if, if the referee made some bad calls, you never blamed other people. And uh, this is something that I always found very inspiring and also What I want to mention is, I mean, you talked about you were in this playing in, in, in championships, but like how many championships did you win in like nine in 22 years or, you know, that's something, some, sometimes when I speak about this, I, I'm really, you know, I don't want to brag or anything, you know, it sounds, it, 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 tendencies are, I don't like to speak so much about myself and, oh, look at me. I'm, I'm a great champion. I won so much, but matter of fact is, you know, do little things right and good things happen that's just what happened in my career as a side product and you know like i said it was 20 22 years in in, in professional team sports and i had the honor to play in 17 finals in 22 years and we lost in uh, a couple of them but nine of them we ended up winning and 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 pulling and, and carrying the trophy around in the city and breaking championship trophies and, and stuff like this. So I was really fortunate. Like I, I started to build this self-talk and to build this attitude and this mindset that it's success. It's not the matter of if it's going to happen, only when it's going to happen. Because of the of the the standard that everybody involved in those teams that I played for put up for themselves as an individual and also as a team, and obviously, and that just makes it so much fun if you if if you work with people who always want to get better. Of course, it doesn't work every day. You always have to, those bad days. But what I found from working with and and watching the best in the world in what they did. They did the simplest things over and over and over and over. And it, kind of, it was kind of an eye opener for me because here I grew up that you have to be, you have to do that extraordinary all the time. You have to do that highlight thing all the time and able to be really good, to be a champion. Where, where I found out it was always the little things. The things that even the, the 10 year olds are getting bored practicing. Oh, coach, not again this. Well, Look at the best of the best, what they're practicing, but in the highest form of perfection, it's the little, little, little things, the basic things. And it makes so much sense. It made so much sense for me and it made it so much fun to work with those kind of people because it's the bad days usually, you know, that where you have to show up and bring your best. And that's the, the basic, really, your lowest level is higher than 
the highest level of some others. So that's where my the competition, obviously, that from a from a competition com uh, standpoint, that's where I look at it, and that's what I bring to outside to people outside of sports too, is that how I experienced being a champion didn't mean like winning over everything. You know, you have to use your elbows, you have to kill the opponents, and you have to, you know, that's what really strength means: dominating and breaking other people or other teams. That's not the truth. This level of respect within comp competitors in our sport, at least, I can only talk from my perspective, was immensely high. Obviously, you wanted to win and you did everything you could do to win, but always with the right, for the right reasons. Never win without respect, without being fair. Yeah, you want to be better, but not winning at all costs and always showing being humble, stay on your both. And I learned that from, especially in Scandinavia, that was unbelievable. The greatest champions, the best, the best of the best, how they handled, how they conducted themselves as humans in groups, how they stepped back, how they, how they thought, well, they, they, they put things into perspective as a human being. I'm just the guy who tries to be a good father, a good friend, a good teammate, but then you step into your profession and then you want to be the best of the best and you do everything to get better, to learn and to get better. And, and I really admire that if you combine those two things, trying to be, and that's what obviously what some businesses also manage. The winners, usually the best in the world, they have this. They only take people. If you qualify, well, that's the qualification we need to be able to work with us. But you have to bring this to the table. And that's, that's the soft factors. That's what kind of person are you, my friend? Can I trust you? Can I rely on you when, when it gets difficult? Do you show up for me when I need you? Those are the qualities. And, and so many people think it doesn't fit together. Even my, in my profession, they laugh. They, they used to not laugh at me, but that's the wrong word. That's the, long, the, the wrong expression. Because I was too good <laughs> that they could laugh in my face. Maybe they were mumbling behind my back. But that's how I saw it. Hey, humanity or be a good human, being a fair guy, being a nice guy, being a friendly guy, you can be tough as nails and you can be a fierce competitor and still be that live after this, these values. It fits together like perfectly, like a leather, custom-made leather glove over your hand. So, and that's what I stand for. And that's, that's the reason some organizations are winning more than others, in my opinion. And how can you be blaming? And that's something that we might want to change everywhere. It's that, that's pointing fingers. That, I, I, it's not my fault. It's their fault. It's always waiting for somebody else to take care of things, right? Well, I mean, that was always what I was really impressed uh, by. I've never seen you blame others. You talked rationally about your performance and your team's performance. And I guess also by that, you were looking at where you are able to improve. Whereas, of course, when you blame the others, you cannot improve. So this is at least uh, how I understood it. This humbleness, you know, to, to be so true to, to yourself. So I find it very interesting. And also when it comes to, to failure, I guess, so you talked about failure before. It's a very important part in, in sports. So I'd, I'd be happy if you could elaborate a bit on that and maybe where there's some turning points in your life in in sports or in your private life that uh, led you to grow? Yeah. Well, what you were saying before I answer this question, what we were saying before, I, I made so many mistakes in my, in my life, in my career as a, as a player, as a person, and taking this kind of responsibility to step in front of the camera and talk about failure after you lost, for example. That was something that, that uh, came with, being in that position as a captain, for example, as be a leader, where usually the leader steps in front when things go bad. Doesn't matter if it's his fault or not. He 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 protects the the weaker link, so to speak. So the person doing that has to has to have this kind of strength. I didn't have that strength all the time. I learned and through practicing that, through putting my face in that camera. And screwing up interviews, for example, and saying stupid things. And I did that too. I, I made a big mistake as a, as a captain when I was really, really disappointed after World Championship, for example, in Austria. We, we played, I played two, three, 
world championships in in Austria throughout my career. Two in the in the highest level in the A pool and one in the B where we went up again to the highest uh, division. And obviously winning was fun, but the losing, the going down when we when we lost at home and we did not get I felt we didn't get the support from the crowd throughout the tournament. At the end, you know, playing in Austria and getting booed when you lose, it's something that hurt really bad to all players. And I was really frustrated. And I let that frustration out a little bit in one interview. I said I was really disappointed by not getting the support from the crowd. And obviously, that was my that was a big mistake saying that because there's different perspectives from everything. But from my perspective in that situation, I was really hurt, but I was not a good leader in that way. I got a lot of criti uh, criticism for that. And uh, I, I told myself, I'm not gonna, I'm never going to make that mistake again, that I act out of pure emotion without taking that time. If, if I'm too emotional, I rather don't give an answer or, or say, let's talk about it tomorrow. It's a lot better from a leadership perspective or from a perspective of making a decision, an important decision. So, so I failed uh, in that regard many times. And that's the introduction of the answer of, the, of, the, of the, your question about failure. I mean, who likes to fail, right? It's so much more fun winning than failing. If I could choose, I would choose winning over failing every time. But knowing from what I know, and I don't think it's enough to read a line or a quote that fail fast, fail, fail forward, and this kind of stuff. It's something that you have to feel for me. And I made this I made this a habit by finding out that through getting a feel for something and attach some kind of emotion to it and uh, analyzing what kind of effort did I put in, what did I do in order to succeed, and what didn't I do? Because that was the result. It was kind of failure. What could I influence? What 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 was I not able to influence? And trying that anyway, even if I'm insecure. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I don't know. I don't know. Should I do it? What what I what can I lose if I do it? Do I look stupid? What were the other what will the other people think? What will my family think? What will my friends think? What will the people think that I don't even know but their opinion so many times seems to be so important. I try to f actively fight against those kind of feelings and do it anyway. When it was something that I felt strongly in my I, I need to do this. I need to do this. What happened by forcing myself to fail or to put myself into that position? Obviously, I did fail many times, but one really important thing happened. If I, you know, and I learned this through my years, I can speak about it now. Well, many times you find out that what you thought would be so ugly or so painful, if that happens, then, oh my God, it's not that bad after all. So what was I worried about in the first place? Then you find a way how to get better quickly. And then you can make a system out of it. So go practice, go practice. And when I come from a tactical standpoint with failure, for example, and with fears, uh, many times it, people fail uh, and, and failing, I mean, also is not trying stuff, not even trying stuff and not succeeding because that's learning really. But not trying stuff, that's, that's the biggest failure for me. Not being able to get over that first hurdle because of whatever excuse you can make is that once you start practicing, uncomfortable things probably stay uncomfortable all your life. I mean, I hate cold showers, for example. I hate it. I don't like it. Even though my name is cold in English, kalt. But I don't like it. I'm, I'm freezing all the time. So, but by practicing taking those cold showers, if there's only cold water, I mean, if I want to get clean, I, I have to use the shower. So I'm going to get used to it. So I'm raising my level, my pain resistance level. And it's still uncomfortable, but on this level and not on this level anymore. So, or is the fear of public speaking, for example, speaking in front of a group, a kind of podcast that we're doing. I mean, if I if you realize that that, um, and you know that better than I do, I think top three fears, biggest fears of people all over the world is the fear of public speaking. Think about it. 
that, okay, some people are born with their natural ability to speak, but still you have to learn that kind of art. There's a lot of things to learn about it, but some people are really, they're great if they're talking to themselves, but then suddenly you stand, they stand somewhere and they're, you know, knees are shaking, cold sweat, whatever. But if I know that from, from a competitive standpoint that seven out of 10 or nine out of 10 people would not like to stand on stage where I am right now or have this microphone in my hand. Well, what kind of advantage would that give me if I would be that one person who gets better at that? You don't have to be perfect, but practice that. So that's like, and that's how I see attacking your fears. The fears that, that, that give you an edge, for example, or you really want to get better. You need it as a skill in your profession or where you want to go. You're going to need that. And that's, you know, people don't, I don't think people ask the right questions. What do I have to bring to the table in order to reach my goals, for example? If that skill is something that you don't like, well, you better get practicing, buddy. Un un otherwise, <laughs> life is not fair sometimes. Life is competition sometimes. So I see it from that uh, um, standpoint too. So embracing this kind of failure is something that, is not fun, but it's you can develop a great system of taking little steps and getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. So that's what I had to do in sports. So every so obviously that was a little little uh, easier for me. And then being embedded in the team, that's the great things about the great great thing about a team. There is different roles, and and sometimes one person is really good and hot and in the flow, and the other person is struggling. He can be hiding. The team can take, you know, take care of one or two in the pack if they're not great at that time. And then it shifts again, energy shifts. And then there's maybe that flow moment where everybody, everything is just rolling. And then there is the moment when nothing works, when there is total system breakdown. And then it, when, that, then it gets really interesting about uh, failure. And usually that happens when... Uh, you think you're better than you are and you stop doing what made you successful in the first place. You're a little bit too full of yourself. You, you know, sometimes it happened to me also. So, and then, and then there is so many questions you can ask, what do you fall back? And that's, that's, that's uh, really the crisis that we have in our world uh, um, right now, um, where there is so much fear and uh, so much uncertainty which was there before the uncertainty, but not in the in the not in the public awareness, maybe. And now everybody is aware. Oh my God, it could be different tomorrow. What's going to happen tomorrow? And uh, and that's where I think some athletes who come from this kind of competitive background have a great advantage if you develop those kind of skills because dealing with crisis and preparing for the moment that you cannot predict. Is always you have to re really rely on the basics. Back to the basics. That's what, what you know. When we play championship games, for example, when those big games come, when those big games come, there is there is a group of people who are who are suddenly afraid of losing in that one big game, and then is the other group, and they say, you know, we cannot we cannot lose what we don't have. We just keep going. We just do what we do every day. We go back to the basics. We keep doing what we're doing. And I have this great, 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 for me, a great story in my head. Because I felt we fell in that trap too with, with, with teams when we didn't lose, uh, when we didn't win finals. We're like, okay, okay, today we're going to have the best day, the best game of our life. And we, we're not going to get scored on. We're not going to, let's not do this. Let's not do this. And we were too tight and the other team just played and enjoyed the moment and we lost, for example. And I had this, I have this story in my head when I was watching, and I might be totally wrong, but that's the impression I had. I was watching Dominic Team, the tennis star, play against Novak Djokovic in the final in at the Australian Open a couple of years ago. Might be he, he has not won a huge a Grand Slam title back then or a huge tournament. And uh, and he was dominating. Uh, Djokovic, I think he was number one that time, and obviously he was probably number one most of the time in the last couple of years. So when he was dominating, such a great player, so much energy, and Djokovic, he did some uh, unusual things for his kind of style. 
he lost his temper sometimes. He did not seem concentrated. He was arguing with him a little bit. So he was out of, out of his, out of his zone a little bit. His body language was different. And the other guy was just doing his things and he was taking all the big shots and he was winning. So he was dominating. But Djokovic, he stayed in it, but he, you know, he was on the verge of losing. So the longer the game went on, there were those crucial moments came. And Dominic Thiem did not hit the winner. And he was like, and, whoa, it was, it was so close. One of the big shots. And that was the moment where I could feel from my experience where the one guy, the real champion, who knew how it felt to win, he kind of refocused and said, hey, what in God's name am I doing here? Refocus back to the basics. It was like two breaths, two times breathing, one little break, not, not arguing anymore, not, not throwing anything, you know, not, not making big moves, just playing basic, highest level basic tennis. And the other guy started doing, okay, the next one. I have to hit the next one. I really want to hit the next one. And he was taking risks and he was failing again. Like, oh, all right, oh, he's, no, I'm not going to make it. Well, he started to have this inner struggle. The one guy just relaxed and did the simple things. And the other guy tried to force it and was starting, in my opinion, to, to, to get afraid. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to win again. Oh, I, I don't want to lose this one. So obviously we know how it turned out. The, the big champion, he won. He kept holding on. And the young champion, the former, the future champion, he was not there yet. He was not there yet. He didn't have the basic to fall back into when he had to refocus. And that's, I think that's one of the, the secrets that how to get out of a crisis, to know what's your base level, to realize, hey, I'm out of line, take a deep breath and refocus. And that's in a nutshell what the, the story of, of failure for me and how I approach this means. And I had some, uh, some failures in my, in my career or some setbacks, not failures, but real setbacks where, for example, a big injury occurred when I was making a name for myself again in Germany. I played for Kör the Kölner Haie, Cologne Sharks. And I felt like, uh, yeah, this is, I came back from the States and I wanted to start a big career again in, in, in Europe. And perfect setting for me in, in, uh, in Cologne. I love the city. I love the team. I love the guys. But then I got injured in Switzerland when I played the Spengler Cup, that uh, famous tournament uh, after Christmas. And I had my, my left arm, my elbow in a cast for six weeks and an operation and a little argument with the, with the coach and with the sport director back then because we made the decision that I had to take this operation. I trusted the doctors, so they were pissed at me, but I was out of the team, couldn't practice with the team. So, but I really had to push really, really, really hard for myself. But the comeback, it, you know, it, we had a good season, the team was winning, and we started the playoffs. I think we were leading after the, the, the regular season. I, I, I should call that statistic guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we lost in the first round. I just made it back in the lineup for those, for the first round. So I made it back. I saved the season. I practiced. I worked my butt off to get back in the lineup. And we made it. And we lost in two games straight. First round, pew, out. I had two great games. Success for myself. I scored two goals and had a couple assists. But the season was over. So it was a big failure for the whole team. So I'm like, oh my God, what, what, what kind of season is that? You know, that's going to break all the momentum. I didn't get a new contract with the Cologne Sharks. They kept me waiting. They, they changed a lot of players. You know, it was a big upset. And uh, I was like, I was really down. What's, what's going to happen now with me? Where can I go? And I ended up signing in Sweden. And Sweden for me, Fayette, that was like, what? What, what are they, what, what do they want from me? That was like the highest level. I had the highest respect for, for the Swedish, the Scandinavian and the Russian hockey. That's how, where I grew up. My idols were from Russia and from Sweden. So, and the best team there signs me up and, 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 and calls me. And I was, I was a little, not scared, but I was intimidated. I was supposed to be a goal scorer up there and I got the role of, of, of goal scoring. So. Uh, long story short, the reason why I had the best year in my career came from that injury that I had in December and from thinking my career is going to, I'm going to kill my career now. 
but by working hard, like really pushing, 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 pushing with the help of the other coaches, big setback at the end of the year, I ended up signing for this team. And they signed me only because they knew me from when I was 16, 17, 18, 19 years in Austria. Because they were watching me. They were playing in Austria back then. And those were the coaches then. I left an impression back then and they followed my career. And they followed me for years. And then that moment was there when I got the chance to play for them. Big pressure. First Austrian in that league, in that team. And I had the best career, uh, the best year of my career. But it's the first time I had a chance to practice for six months straight. I was strong as an ox for me. You know, I was in the best shape of my life. Usually you, you play so much and then you play the world championships and you, you, start, you, you finish your career in the middle of May, for example. You have like two weeks break and then the season starts again. So there's no chance to recover. There's no chance to really take care of, of some injuries that pile up over the year. You just keep practicing and just keep holding a, a, a form. And you, I was, there were some years I was exhausted after the season. I was, I was a wreck, really. It was a, young, a long year. And, and then you start practicing again and you keep pushing. So no wonder that guys are getting tired over the years and that sometimes injuries occur when there is mental fatigue and then the body breaks down. So, but this time I had a huge failure, a huge setback, a huge defeat, but I had the chance to build something for six months. And that foundation, it ignited the highlight part of my career. I, I, could, I, I took that momentum um, and built something for years. That's when I became this kind of winner again in different role in my team. And then I had the next failure by having a terrible season, being really prepared, but nothing worked the whole year. And I did not know how to break it for a long time. But by taking that step back again, changing my direction, I became a captain. I took the next stage in my career and, and I was the leader of a team by myself when we won a championship with the Vienna Capitals. That was a huge thing for that organization, winning after 43 years. So... And I played injured and I had really had to, I had to bring something to the table to hold the team together, to put the team together. So that was the next stage. So every time something huge and bad happened in my career, I came back stronger because of those kind of, uh, and, and this kind of came, hey, I, I can make a system out of this. So no matter what happens in my life now, I live in the moment. I know what led me to this what I put into it. And if something happens, I find a way to start over again, to, to recalibrate, so to speak, and to put system into work and saying, okay, accepting, accept, accepting that, accepting that things turn out different than you expect sometimes, but then you shift, you shift, you take what you learned from that lesson and you shift. Don't whatever happened, happen. Who cares? Learn from it and move on. So basically what I'm hearing, what you say throughout uh, our conversation now is really that the basics, the fundamentals are really, really important. And once you have a good fundament by practicing the, the basics, basically, that this in a way through that championships emerge, not only that, of course, but that's like the baseline, because this is what you always fall back to. And this is what carries you when it when it matters, basically. Yeah, that, that's the, that's the way that's the way I see it. And I, I'm, if I really th if I think about it, if I would if I would have a company with the highest standard and there is different roles in every company, different things, some are more uh, are bigger jobs than others, for example, but every little details, every little detail matters. You want to have the best person for the job. You want to have the best woman, the best guy. If it's sound, if it's if it's it's a, if it's video, if it's accounting, it, whatever whatever it is, you want to have the best possible person for your team, right? And there's lots of them, it, and it might be the same level that you have to bring on, uh, uh, like for every other company. But for this job in my company, I don't take anybody because anybody can do the job, I want to take the best possible person. So 
who's got the basic skills to deliver something simple and really with pride and with excellence every day. And not only, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing what, what, uh, what separates winners and pros from amateurs really, in my opinion, is not, you know, succeeding once is something, it's great. It's hard to achieve and it's, you know, hats off to anybody who, who, who wins in anything. But bringing something every day on a certain level and repeating and repeating, that's when I get goosebumps, when I see people delivering for 10, 15, 20 years in a high pressure, high performance environment, because then you know, those are the people you have to talk to. What are they doing? Who is on their team? Who is on their team? If you talk to Sebastian Vettel, for example, and I practiced, uh, I, I saw him, I practiced beside him a little bit when I was playing for Red Bull in the Red Bull training center. He was a young boy and I was with the hockey team. Very nice person, how I, how I got to know him. But I saw so I follow his career. I like, I really like this guy. Well, who is a person like this hiring? The best possible therapist, the best possible nutritionist for him, the best possible whoever, what kind of PR lady or guy, whatever. It's the best possible team for him. Anybody could do it, but he wants to have the best because that's what Magic Johnson said. And I, I was part of a mastermind in, in online some time ago. And, and he stepped on stage and he's a huge businessman. And he said, you know, I, had, I got an advice from, from uh, a friend. Uh, I wanted to meet a guy and learn from this guy. And I said, I need some help. And he gave me the telephone numbers of like 20, 30 guys that could be possible mentors for me in business, in this, in this, in this, in whatever, in finance, in different aspects when he was still playing. So he called everybody, he said. He called everybody. And he got to have lunch with Two thirds of those high profile people, because just because he asked, that's the first thing. How are, what are they going to talk to me? No, he just asked, hey, do you have time for me? I would learn from your experience. So they sat down and he said seven or eight of them became his mentors until the end. And he said, because you know what? I don't care. The best have to run with the best. And this kind of who you want to learn from if you get advice. Learn from those people who are already there where you would like to be. And usually it goes the other way around that people get advice from people who didn't show for themselves, who didn't have that feeling inside their body. So I love therapists, for example, in my, you know, as an athlete, I got a lot of therapy and I love those guys and girls who knew exactly how it felt, how the pain felt that I'm feeling in my back right now when they're starting therapy because they can relate. That was really important for me. That kind of opened uh, my eye a little bit uh, too, is that what kind of people are you surrounding yourself with for even to you had, that, that people that have pride, they know their role, they accept their role and do even the little things with excellence because that's what makes the difference at the end. I had this key moment in my career when I was in Sweden. The first year we got, we, we won the championship in Sweden. And uh, I, I told you it was unbelievable for me. I, I, I scored most goals in that season in, in, in Sweden, which was a, a great achievement for, my, for myself. But we won the championship. But everybody was like really working for each other. And at the end, it was the guys who didn't get the most ice time during the year. It was those guys who just got a couple of shifts who made a difference. You know, somebody gets hurt at the end and they were ready to jump in. Um, they blocked some shots and they did little, little, little things that made a difference for us as a team. That was year one. Year two, as the reigning champions, we were so good. We had a great season again and we came all the way to the finals. And we played against the uh, Frölunda Göteborg, the Frölunda Indians. And, uh, and we lost in game six against them in Frölunda. And if I looked back, if I look at the pictures and, the, and the, the, the footage from back then, they had this, what we had the year before, this kind of, yeah, everybody together. Like even the guys who didn't play a second, they were like, yeah, like they were on the ice themselves. The guy just filling up the water bottles or opening the door, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter. And on our side of the bench, even though we were really this close, there were some heads underneath the boards because they did not get the ice time they thought they deserved. 
because they didn't play on the first power play. And when somebody scored, not everybody was, you know, they were all cheering, yes, and it was still great, but it was not with the full heart. So guess who won the championship? You know, and that's the little things. It's always the little things. And th those were those key elements. And, and I still feel that in my body. And when I talk about it, 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 it you know, I get emotional and I, I, I feel it on my skin. And I know and I, I can respect it so much when somebody else is creating this kind of atmosphere for teams, for people. And I can respect my biggest opponent, even if I hate his guts privately. I wouldn't go for a coffee or don't want to talk to him, but I can respect what kind of effort somebody puts in in order to be successful. I can respect that if there's the right values behind it doesn't matter. I know what it takes or I, in, in that field where I came from anyway. And, uh, and I think that makes all the difference in the world. So I'd really like to know now you're doing the championship academy and basically what I can hear from your experience, it's all things that really what you have shown with your career becoming a champion nine times, it's not just luck but it's the effort that you put into it and the things that you talk about. I mean, those are things that can be translated to all areas of life. And I'm really curious about your championship. It's called Championship Academy or what is it called? Uh, Champions Mind Academy. Champions Mind Academy. Is there the idea to how to translate your knowledge of sports into life outside of sports or what is it all about? Well, champions mind, I use, I use those terms from the sports world, the champions mindset and the champions mind academy. A real champion for me is not a person who is doing sports. It could be anybody with a mindset of how can I help? What can I, what can I do to influence taking, taking my life into my own hands, being a good father, being a good friend, being open to learning being open for discussion, changing standpoints, listening to different perspectives and making up your own mind. That's, that's a champion's mindset for me. That's something to being able to adapt, to contribute, but also the willingness to perform, obviously. The, the willingness to bring the best out of you, not selling yourself. That's something that I use with my, with my kids sometimes is... Uh, I would love to help you believe in yourselves, working hard, not taking ownership and not selling yourself short. And I tell you what reason why, because it's, it's such a good feeling. If you succeed in something, if you get better at something, that's how you get, how you gain self-confidence by starting from a certain point where you suck everybody sucks in the beginning it doesn't matter the biggest stars the best in the world in anything they start somewhere and then they take little steps of progression and they have this kind of they develop this kind of feeling i can do this i'm good at it and obviously they they start they have well if you're lucky if you're lucky you have an environment of people around you that push you And that, hey, yes, yeah, keep going, keep going. You can do it. You can do it or helping. Not everybody is that lucky, but this environment is at least as important as it is what you think in your own head, how you talk to yourself, what you're learning, uh, what you initially have in yourself maybe, but also what you get from the outside. And, you, and there's many of us, and especially, especially the, young, the younger, the, <laughs> the young generation needs a couple of things. There's this unbelievable potential, that energy that, that I, I, I would like to call myself as a, I'm an investor. It sounds really good. I'm an investor right now. After my professional career as an athlete, I'm an investor. I invest in people. I invest in talent to, to ignite this kind of talent. It's the most beautiful thing to see kids watching when they are learning something and the kind of joy they develop when they Succeed in something, falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up, falling down, not thinking, hey, I'm a loser. I can't do it the first try. You know, I want to jump to step four already. No, I keep going. I keep going. I'm progressing. So 
what if you have you have something that reinforces the positive things reinforces the learning reinforces all the values that need that you need to develop or to have in order to be successful yes to reach your goals yes doesn't have anything to do with winning with winning it has to do with basic why you do something but at the same time combine this with the practical things the stuff that you can actually learn because talent is something that well and that science tells us that that can be developed it's not yeah you are inherit you inherit some some uh, some kind of foundation how to perform in different sports for example just the way my physique is for example i'm probably not built to be a great swimmer but i'm i'm pretty muscular guy i i build muscle quickly i can uh, generate power with my muscle fibers really quickly so my ratio of a slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers is in favor of sports where i need to sprint for example be really fast so there's some science behind this and there's obviously i use what is inherited i mix it with the science that i can i can produce something that gives me the edge in a competition for example so there is techniques i can i putting the the soft factors together and using techniques to learn something to get better to practice something it totally makes sense for me so from the from in, in the in the area that i lived in for so many years we practiced and analyzed everything we practiced everything and now people are investing in skills training and nutrition and everything 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 so much theory but what is totally forgotten and usually makes a difference is the way you deal with pressure the way to deal with somebody that, that who doesn't like you how to approach it, like how to fit in the group how to deal with the teacher that doesn't like you with the unfair coach how to if i ask you what are your values what do you really stand for i mean how many people have to think hard for many minutes before they can give an honest answer because something that you're not dealing with that stuff usually that doesn't have space time and space in normal life but at the end of the day in pressure situations that's what it always comes down to is knowing yourself having this identity having a set of values that you want to live in um having clear goals in order to find some kind of direction you want to go building the kind of environment that you need and that supports you that's what professionals do and that's how professionals get successful so we, if we grow up and we don't have this kind of knowledge and we don't have this kind of environment everything is left to chance and you know chances are sometimes it's successful but many times people are frustrated disappointed questioning themselves or like myself <laughs> in the middle of their life you know that when guys i'm turning i'm turning 47 in a couple of weeks it's a perfect perfect age for the midlife the, the old midlife crisis where guys kind of reminisce about what happened in their life what have i done so far and i took a conscious choice to take things into my own hands and not settling for less than i want to achieve and that means like okay let's go let's build something and start from from day one i want to i get this knowledge who do i need asking the right questions who am i i had to do this the hard way obviously but i was ready for it i had this i had this environment growing up this kind of knowledge and still had to start from zero but and many people fail or are really hopeless in my age when i look around unhappy living not leading not really happy lives although they might be successful on the outside on the inside is a different story so what if we can give people young people a chance to learn stuff to practice stuff early early on those life skills that going to be needed and i want to put all the effort in that i can to give this to the next generation with everything i have to offer or everything you have to offer if they ask you for help hey would you jump in certis I have this mentorship course and I have this group of unbelievable young people they would need your wisdom and your knowledge would you be willing to give it to them and come for sure you would come and say hey 
anything I can give because it feels so good to help somebody else. That's an environment I want to create this kind of championship team of young people that want to reach their potential and are willing to accept that it's going to be hard. It's going to be painful sometimes. It's not only going to be uphill, but start investing now. And that's where my competition <laughs> feeling comes, you know, investing, investing, investing uh, in yourself. It pays dividends at the end. Definitely. And that's where the Champions Mind Academy comes from, you know, that that kind of, okay, it's a, it's a knowledge hub really for people who want to excel. And I start with working with young kids and I start taking in leaders from who are already grown people with a lot of responsibility because there is this generation of leaders coming that say, hey, I'm open. I want to get better. I want, I have to get better. It's, I'm just starting. And I just had a talk, uh, and that's the people I'm really fascinated um, of a guy who sold this. He comes from Holland and um, a very successful entrepreneur who sold one of his companies 20 years ago. And he financially, he was, he was all set. But he was trying to be a mentor and building different companies. And he said, you know, I, I have a problem right now. I'm 60 and all my peers are asking me, what, what the hell are you doing? You should be on your sailing boat or you should be enjoying the, the, the fruit of your life. You know, you've worked hard. You've been successful. What are you doing? And he said, you know, hey, I'm just starting. I'm 60 years old. I don't know how to deal with this age thing. I have to find a new environment of people because I'm, I feel like I have so much to give. What an attitude, right? What an yeah, attitude. Definitely. Beautiful. So basically, when to sum it up, uh, from my perspective, it's the academy is really a place where people learn how to think like a champion, how to act like a champion and lay out the whole life in a way with a human heart, but uh, competitiveness to do something good. I'm a, I'm a dreamer, but I also want to win. Winning is fun. And uh, life is not always fair. It's, I think it's important that, that you also accept the negative things in life and be, you're ready. And then and once you're ready and you train, you, you have a definite choice you can make at one point. And you can always choose what side you're choosing. And it should be, it should be a conscious decision to do the good things and to do the right things. And uh, if you do the right things constantly, good things will happen. I mean, right things, you always have different pr perspectives, of course. But if it comes from the right from the right place in yourself, has a lot of a lot to do with awareness. And the Champions Mind Academy should be a place for people who want to learn, who want to explore where they can go. So I start with this mentoring, where not it's not that I'm the teacher who teaches everything, and you just sit there and receive knowledge. It's something that where I share experience, I bring in experience from other professionals from people who were successful in whatever day and learn from their failures and tell their stories so the young generation can make their own faults. So the only, the only shortcut is that you get access to information from real life, not only theory, but from real life people who've been there and done that. And now you go and do it by yourself. I like it. It's a little bit like uh, I like that Montes Maria Montessori when she said, I help other people do it themselves. So that's what I start with my mentoring programs. And it doesn't matter if you're a young athlete or, or if you're not into sports, what we are talking about, what I'm trying to, to give applies to everything, to every, every situation in life. So, and it's starting, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a four week program that we are, that we're offering to start with, but it continues with the monthly champions mind, uh, academy club, the future stars, a mentoring club, we call it. And so it's something because champions, champions mindset, that's something that we can, that we're going to learn and continue to practice all our life. It, it never ends. It never ends. And it, it, it uh, so. I'm really looking forward to it. It's really exciting. It's really exciting to me. Totally new field again. And uh, I've been uh, doing mentoring sessions with, with young people from all over the world for two years now. And I've worked with hundreds of, of kids and, and players from all different ages. But in this kind of setup, it's a new thing. So I'm like, I'm like a rookie again. I love it. I love the, uh, I love the competition. I love, the, uh, I love how it's going to be turned out. 
So when it comes to personal development and leadership, I mean, you've you've said, I think, uh, most of the things already, but to sum it up, like which paradigms do you believe need to be challenged? Which false beliefs maybe need to be challenged when it comes to personal development and, and leadership? You said it, false beliefs. I mean, in my opinion, what I had to learn about myself is to question everything. Where I came from, why, what I'm thinking. Is everything true, what my parents were telling me, what the mayor was telling me when I grew up, all those, those institutions that I had 100% trust in when I was growing up, that's just the way it is. That, that's how things are done in our society, in our culture. It turns out to be that many things were great, many things were not as great and need to be changed. So the only constant is really change and being ready for change. I think that's something that, that we really have to get into our heads and embrace as a positive and not as a negative that, that, that brings fear and, and, and uh, development to the worse to us. That change is, that's just the nature of life. We're evolving, we're changing, and we should embrace this to be positive. That's one thing that was really important to me to reconsider, and I really like that book from Vishen Lakhiani, Code of an Extraordinary Mind, where he talks about exactly about this stuff coming from a different the religious, religious background, from a different cultural background, but asking the same questions. Does it really fit the way I want to live my life? Does it fit to the society I want to live in right now? And uh, then making a conscious choice, what kind of life I'm choosing, what kind of friends am I choosing, what kind of discussions I want to lead. Um, I think that's really important. That's one thing. And the second thing is I love to talk about outer leadership and inner leadership in my, in my, in my work, where outer leadership is, I mean, the leadership from being a leader of a company, being the leader of a group setting, setting a framework for, that other people can be successful in so we can be successful as a group. Um, that's really important to know, to seeing that the leader doesn't have to be the guy who knows it all. The leader hasn't, doesn't have to be the guy who doesn't show any weakness, who is not vulnerable. You know, the leader is the leader because of a natural ability to influence people, to, to have that vision, to, to, be, to be that person that, that can build trust, to have a certain role in a group, but just being a normal person with the same flaws and the same clues and finding something together, collaborate with people. That's that leadership that I'm looking for to change and to help build in, 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 in businesses, for example. And, but then there's the other side. And I, that's something that was really painful to, for me to see many times, especially in kids, in young athletes, that kind of attitude doesn't, doesn't matter, no judgment where it comes from. It's just the reality of the fact that a lot of times you're seeing this kind of approach, sitting and watching, okay, let's see. Okay, coach, make me good. Teacher, let's see how good this teacher is, how, what, what he is teaching me. Not that approach of, it's up to me too to be good. What can I do? What can I influence? Even though, because in life sometimes, that's and again in sports, can I influence as a normal player of a team who is going to be my coach? if he's going to like me or if he's if he fits in his thinking perfect in the way I like to play, I still have to fulfill a certain role on the team so we can be successful. It doesn't matter if it's 100% perfect for me personally. I still have to deal with it. Otherwise, in my world where I came, I came from, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to win. I'm going to be that guy who gets pushed around and pushed around and just... People are passing by because they're willing to suck it up when it gets hard because they know it's going to be hard sometimes and they are asking, what can I learn from this? I still have to do it. What can I learn? What, I, what, what kind of experience do I take away from that situation? So this kind of attitude, when you bring this in your thinking, in your mindset of people you're bringing into your team, you cannot lose. And that's missing a lot of times this kind of, okay, let's see what they can bring so I can be good. 
it's not my responsibility. It's always somebody else's responsibility. And this kind of attitude needs to be changed. So my final question is, well, it's about your legacy. And uh, as a sports pro, you do have a legacy. That's undoubtable. But what would you like your, your legacy as a human to be? Oh, my God. To be honest, I've never really thought about it that hard. Something that I'm, I'm, I'm playing with is I want to be somebody who tried to get the best out of him and was not afraid of, of taking a risk um, and find excuses why he didn't try just because he was afraid of failing, for example. That's something for myself, this kind of, okay. It's, and it's not about winning all the time. It's just that it's a great feeling and there is so much potential in me. And I believe in that, that I want to keep pushing. But big turning point in my life, for example, in putting into perspective how important I, myself, I was for myself, um, was when the kids came into my life, obviously. That was kind of, okay, that was this, this immediate change. Okay, <laughs> it, the, I would change my life in a second if I could save my kids. And any any dad usually would say that, and any, any, any uh, mother would say that. Once you have that little one in your hands and you look at it the first time, then you have that feeling, then you know, then you know. And that, that changed everything. So... And, uh, and I talked about a fr uh, with a friend of mine about uh, that, that education and what we learn, how we have to bring up our children, we have to uh, teach them, educate them, really. I think the biggest thing is to be a good role model and uh, to do the things as good and as fair and as, as uh, fun as I can do to show my kids that you have choices and that it's up to you. And you don't have to be like me. I'm an idiot in many ways. I'm, I'm, I, I was pretty good at some things, but I, I suck at other things. And so will you. But, you know, find something with passion and do it, make it a lifestyle. And that's something that, that I would look back. If they look at me uh, one day and I would say, you know what, dad, he had a great life. He enjoyed it. He did not look back too much. Let's celebrate his life. And he showed us how to, how to contribute something, to give something to other people, to take care of yourself, to treat the body right, to be a good person. Hey, what, what else can I, can I ask for? What else can I? And the same thing, if I am able to live that way and to get better at that, it doesn't matter what I do, I will be successful as well. I have something to show for if it's important, you know, to the outside world. For sure, good things happen when you do good things. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. really a pleasure talking to you and hope to see you back again once. And all the best for your projects. Yeah. You're a rookie again. That I love this sentence. Dieter Kalt is a rookie again. <laughs> thank Always you very much. Exactly. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for staying tuned for this edition of Challenging Paradigm X. If you liked this episode with Dieter Kalt, feel free to share it with your community so Dieter's message gets spread even further. Check out the show notes where you'll find the links to his work and the Champions Mind Academy. Please hit subscribe and rate my podcast if you liked it and I'd also be very glad if you write me a review. Next week, we are up with another edition of Challenging Paradigm X. Until then, I wish you a great week.